Mike, say Mike, say Mike check. Mike check. Listen, all you people, oh, listen to my song. My heart is filled with trouble. I don't know what is wrong. My heart is filled with trouble. I got trouble on my mind. For what I see around me is getting worse all the time. The balance of the world seems is almost dead and gone. The common bonds of decency are severed one by one. The rich keep getting richer and the poor get poorer too. The wealth of the many in the hands of the few. They act like towering princes we're at their beck and call. A dozen cars, the private jet, we've our backs against the wall. They live their flights of fantasy while we struggle just to eat. Instead of living simply that we might simply be. Don't look for politicians to even up the score. Don't look for world leaders to do any more. Don't look for corporations to lend a helping hand. They've helped themselves enough, and now it's time to take a stand. Yeah. Oh, listen, all you people, to what I have to say. I do not mean to trouble you or bother you today. I only want to sing about a lost equality. If we want it any different, it's up to you and me. That was the Occupy Wall Street protest song from the bottom 99. Welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Bredos. I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and Yeshiva University here in New York. Our guest today on The Radical Imagination is Michael Hudson. He was on our March 8th show. We had such an overwhelmingly positive response to the show. We've asked him to return today, and he's been gracious enough to accept. Unlike most economists, He's been a fierce champion and advocate for the economic rights of the poor, workers, disenfranchised, and the vulnerable around the world through his scholarship and lifelong activism. His unique economic analysis has explored history's main engine of economic exploitation, the banking, creditor, and financial system's ever-increasing extraction of value through interest payments. The rentier class and fire sector, finance, insurance, and real estate have long succeeded in cleverly depicting themselves as part of a productive economy. Yet for centuries, these systems were recognized as being parasitic. Now with the United States losing some 10 million jobs in just the past two weeks and the world awash in debt, the total world gross domestic product is $90 trillion. The public and public and private debt is an astounding, mind-boggling $260 trillion. The pandemic has given this parasitic, parasitic sector yet another and even more vicious opportunity to exploit and devour humanity. As our guest puts it, the recently passed Trump bank and landlord relief bill, mistakenly named the coronavirus bill, starts by providing banks with an even larger giveaway of wealth than they received from Obama in 2008, helping the bank's financial and real estate sectors in a so-called free market system is conflated with helping the, the industrial economy and the general living standards of most Americans. The essence 
of a parasite is not only to drain the host's nourishment, but also to dull the host's brain so that it does not recognize that the parasite is there. These debt bondage economies of Western countries are heading us down a spiral of poverty, decline, injustice, and human despair. Michael Hudson is a distinguished research professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, a researcher at the Levy Economic Institute at Bard College, former Wall Street analyst, a political consultant of governments on finance and tax policy, and a popular and sought-after commentator and journalist. He devoted his entire scientific and historical work to the study of both domestic and foreign debt, loans, mortgages, and interest payments. His analysis and warnings to us all are even more profoundly necessary in these pandemic days and nights. This is just the first in a series of cascading crises. Welcome so much. Thank you for being back again here on the Radical Imagination. Michael, it's so great to, to see you again. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Uh, how are you doing? Are, are you feeling okay? I know we're all trying to keep safe and well and strong. How are things going? Well, I just got back from a walk in Queens Park. Uh, there was hardly anybody on the streets, but uh, there were a good number of people in the park. Uh, I was given finally a face mask by uh, the building's uh, uh, super, uh, and my Chinese friends uh, say that they've mailed me some uh, masks to keep me safe uh, from over there. So they're sending foreign aid to uh, New York like we're the third world country. There we are. Well, in a sense, we are, aren't we? Aren't we? Uh, we're turning more and more into it uh, for more and more people. Um, and and so tell us about this so-called bill that's just been passed. What is what is wrong with it in your estimation? How is it perpetuating and exacerbating the problem in your in your analysis? Well, it's sort of like Obama's uh, bailout in 2009 and 10 uh, on steroids. Uh, it's very funny when you read people like uh, Paul Krugman uh, and others, uh, the Democrats are denouncing it all uh, as if uh, it's a, a Republican bill and it's identical uh, with Obama's bill and Obama's philosophy. And it really is, it was unanimously passed. And so I think you should think of it as uh, the Trump Pelosi bill. Uh, it's wrong to blame it on Trump because uh, he simply lifted it wholesale from uh, his campaign backers, who uh, basically are the same as the Democratic National Committee. Uh, the problem is that the bill pretends that by uh, giving money to the banks to lend more money to get the country uh, moving again, uh, that's going to rescue the economy. It's mm -hmm. not rescuing the economy. The bill hurts the economy, uh, injures the economy, and that is deliberate. Uh, uh, and they know that it's doing this because when you give money to the banks, uh, part of it, the uh, 10 trillion, 2 trillion, okay, that's uh, all right that it goes to uh, uh, citizens to help spend. But uh, giving money to the banks uh, and to the landlords specifically, uh, there, are an, there is an enormous giveaway that makes real estate tax exempt for the next 30 years, basically, by uh, giving them uh, an appreciation right off. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I just want to add small businesses as well. Is that that? Are you including them in this in this analysis? Certainly not. A real, no. I was talking okay. specifically about the real estate sector. Uh, the small businesses that they're rescuing are the payday loan sector, the payday loan uh, uh, crooks, and uh, the local uh, 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 usurers and uh, uh, the uh, small uh, landlords, perhaps, uh, which I must say receive most of the small business loans. Uh, but when uh, the Republicans or Democrats small, talk about small business, they mean the landlords who are sort of the front men for the really big real estate interests and for the uh, banks behind them. So let's look at this. When uh, uh, the bill uh, sort of asks landlords to uh, stop evicting people for three months, but let the, let the rents accrue, let the debts accrue. So let's look at what's going to happen. Uh, the three months are over. You're going to have uh, restaurants and small businesses whose major expense is actually rent. They're not going to be doing much business during these three months. The three months, right? Uh, end up uh, owning, uh, owing uh, all of this uh, 
uh, cost of doing business for three months without having any income, what's going to happen uh, at the end of the summer? Uh, New York University, for instance, has just announced that it's uh, not going to be holding uh, a summer school in attendance. It's all going to be uh, over the internet. Uh, well, uh, you can imagine that a, a lot of restaurants uh, here in uh, Queens only have takeout. Uh, not really service. So how are these small businesses going to pay the debts that have mounted up in the last three months? The fact is, uh, they'll have to go out of business, declare bankruptcy, and uh, start all over again, because otherwise, uh, all of the earnings for this year, and next year, and probably the year after that, would have to go to make up the arrears to their landlords, and to their creditors and to the banks. So what pretends to be a coronavirus bill uh, is going to say, you think the virus hit you? Wait till we hit you with the financial bill. It's the financial bailout means how to get how to enable the financial sector to extract so much money from the economy that you drive so many small businesses under that the big uh, capital firm, uh, venture capital firms, and mm -hmm. Capital firms can now begin to pick them up at uh, small prices. So you could call it uh, the monopolization of the U.S. economy bill, uh, or the uh, contributors to the uh, uh, to the po to Washington politicians bill. Uh, it uh, there you they there was a wish list that uh, the banks had, the real estate interests had, the corporate lobbyists had that uh, they've been sort of saving up for just such an opportunity. So the coronavirus is their equivalent of 9-11. Uh, just as in 9-11, President Bush and Cheney pulled out the Let's Invade Iraq and Grab Its Oil uh, program that they had on the books looking for an excuse, right now uh, the coronavirus, uh, the Trump-Pelosi bill uh, gives uh, the banks and the uh, uh, real estate sector uh, an excuse to uh, not only be bailed out as if it's losing money, but then to, to evict uh, the tenants and to uh, make a whole grab bag out of them. To profit, to profit even more. Not and profit. Uh, uh, no, profits, you have to pay income. Uh, rich people don't make profits. Right. Uh, uh, they make capital gains. They're not. Okay. You okay. Only, only the little people make profits. And okay. They're okay. an income. Um, now, um, you said this was conscious on their part, right? This is a rational, this is the way in which they think about these things. There's no moral dilemma to all of this by the, the, the large venture capitalists and so on, Wall Street. Is that correct? Yes. Obviously, the, 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 lobbyists, they, the lobbyists have right. given them these laws. Uh, Trump, uh, as a real estate investor, certainly knows that when he gives the biggest single giveaway to the real estate sector, uh, making sure that it it won't own it, real estate will not make a profit for the next uh, thirty or fifty years, but it'll make enormous uh, uh, cash flow. Uh, it, they they'll call it depreciation. The depreciation schedule pretends that buildings are losing their value even when they're going uh, way up. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, an accounting system, including the national income accounts, that have nothing to do with the real economy. So there's no more way of uh, empirically describing what's happening using uh, official statistics. So uh, it's uh, we're entering a, uh, a kind of just pretend world uh, with a just pretend uh, rationale and, uh, let's say, uh, uh, ni nice language, euphemisms. Mm, okay. So moral suasion, what are the limits? Uh, you, you worked with and talked about the poor people's campaign, for example, with uh, 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 William Barber. Um, you talk about Bernie and his movement and so on. Are these designed to fail? Are they, is there possible ways that these strategies can be used to, to somehow um, control these these habits, these these the, 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 the vicious profits and money that's being made at this point. What's the connection between moral suasion and uh, Reverend Barber and Bernie? Well, I, I guess what I'm asking here is, who speaks for the poor? Who speaks for the workers? Who is standing up for the disadvantaged here? Mainly their employers and their creditors. And they say, what's good for us is good for the workers. We want to save the workers by lending them more money and getting them more in debt and giving them nicer housing at uh, higher rents. Uh, they're speaking for the, they claim to be speaking for the workers. Mm -hmm. And yet, in fact, 
that's not in their interest. Of course right. not. Of right. course not. But they, if they can uh, uh, dominate the media and drown out uh, the, uh, the media, don't uh, have very much of what Reverend Barber says or what Bernie says. Uh, the media uh, says what's good for the workers is good for the banks. And in fact, Joe Biden came out last week and he said, there's going to have to be a second uh, coronavirus bill. And we've got to really focus this time on the banks. Uh, mm -hmm. Biden said, we, we didn't give them enough in the first. We have to give them more so that they can lend more. Now, when you say we have to give the banks more money to lend more to get the economy moving, it means we have to have families and businesses take on more debt uh, so that all more and more of their income can be paid in the form of interest and amortization and uh, financial fees, late fees and penalties and uh, service charges. Uh, so uh, you, you have the double talk about being about as explicit uh, as it can be. And the Democrats, of course, are more uh, adept at uh, euphemism and double talk uh, than the Republicans. As you probably know, uh, we're taping this uh, same day that, that Bernie has now dropped out of the campaign. Uh, so uh, who do you look to? What movement? What organizations? What is there left to represent uh, the interests of, of the vast majority of us? Uh, that's a trick question. I don't know. Very I, don't see it. I, I don't see anyone. Uh, or, uh, there's been, uh, certainly in my profession, the economics profession, uh, all of the uh, major economic journals, uh, the respectable ones, are all uh, taken uh, censored by the Chicago School uh, monetarists and uh, by the uh, neoliberals. So it's very hard to look in the economics profession for uh, very much help here, at least from uh, uh, writers who want and professors who want to get promoted, uh, get tenure and want to advance uh, academically. I uh, don't see very much uh, at, at all. Uh, if you look at what is revealed preference and you look at who are the main voters for Biden, who was it that threw the election to Biden away from Bernie? What did they want? Well, we know what they want. They want lower wages, they want less education, they want more debt, they want more police power, uh, they want uh, uh, more credit and more debt, and they, they would like uh, uh, to see social programs scaled back. That's what the voters want. Uh, that, that, that Rather, that's the revealed preference, if you look at that theory, that uh, their voting reflects uh, as if they've chosen uh, lower living standards and that they believe that uh, the rich should have enough more money so that maybe some of it will uh, trickle down. Trickle down, right. You also work with modern monetary uh, theorists, correct? That's right. Now, uh, I, it, uh, that the Missouri at Kansas City was exactly. uh, probably the center of that. Uh, and I'm also, as you pointed out, a uh, uh, research uh, fellow at the Levy Institute, uh, and I've worked closely with Randy Ray and uh, uh, the others. Uh, ever yeah. So, so tell us a little about that approach that you evidently have still some confidence in. Tell us about what they're attempting to do, what you're attempting to do as a as a as the group. It's not a homogeneous school. Uh, right. The idea of modern monetary theory itself, well, you can trace the roots. Uh, back to functional finance uh, uh, in the 1960s uh, of uh, Lerner. Uh, and you can uh, look at Hyman Minsky as one of the inspirers of it. But modern monetary theory really uh, developed in the 1990s uh, and uh, since as a logic saying that uh, deficit spending is not bad. Government deficit spending, if it is spent into the economy, is mm -hmm. not inflationary. The Chicago monetarists say any government spending is the road to the gas chambers. I've heard that said literally. They say uh, government spending, you're going to end up like Germany uh, in the Weimar area with hyperinflation or like Zimbabwe. They think that a running a government deficit actually increases uh, the consumer price level and that erodes the purchasing power of financial wealth. Well, yeah. that uh, uh, modern monetary theory says that's just silly. First of all, if moder uh, 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 there's a disconnect between financial asset prices, which we've seen going up and up since uh, 2008, 
2009, since the Obama bailout, and uh, where the real economy is going. Uh, consumer prices uh, and incomes and wages, real wages, uh, disposable income has been going down, while asset prices, capital gains, and the wealth of the uh, 1% is going up. So uh, the uh, if there's a sort of crude MMT uh, solution, and that would be simply to run a budget deficit. And at one extreme, there are some uh, MMTers, not my, not me and not my colleagues, uh, but some MMTers say, all you have to do is run a uh, budget uh, deficit, and you'll pump money into the economy, and that money is going to be spent in a Keynesian-style way. It's yeah. going to be uh, spent on hiring labor, especially if the government will build infrastructure, the government will uh, uh, buy goods and services, and these goods and services that the government buys or finances will uh, involve paying labor, and you'll uh, uh, reflate the economy. You'll increase the uh, the a circular flow of income within the production uh, and consumption sector. Well, uh, bad MMT uh, is what you have now uh, discovered by Wall Street and uh, and by uh, England. Uh, the uh, it's the Donald Trump MMT version, saying deficits are wonderful. Uh, we're all for uh, government running a deficit as long as it's spent on Wall Street. Well, the fact is that government, uh, the uh, advocates of government spending, you know, people like uh, Stephanie Kelton, Randy Ray, myself. Uh, the whole group of uh, MMTers uh, were critics of Wall Street. We're not uh, celebrating uh, Wall Street well. Uh, we want to say, well, in or the kind of government deficit spending we're talking about that reflates the economy actually has to be spent on public investment, employment, income transfer, income support. It has to be spent on labor and tangible capital. Uh, the uh, fake MMTers are saying government deficits are great, give it all to the banks, they will provide the credit, and uh, the banks will save uh, uh, the rest of the economy. Well, that's the exact opposite of what we're saying. So uh, every good uh, religion, every good idea, uh, from Jesus to Marxism, can be turned upside down into the opposite. And uh, you're seeing an attempt today to turn uh, the MMT that uh, we all developed in the last three decades uh, into uh, a travesty of uh, uh, bailouts uh, for Wall Street, as if bailing out Wall Street, uh, Joe Biden style, is going to bail out uh, the economy by uh, enabling it to run deeper into debt. So that's the choices we have, then, is the Trump version and the Biden version. Now, I just got uh, a, an email here from Bernie, who's, I think, uh, and Stephanie, of course, Stephanie Kelton is, is one of uh, his, her, uh, his uh, advisors, economic advisors. So he has, uh, and I'm just going to read briefly here, uh, the, the uh, six core provisions that must be included in the next legislation. I wonder if you could uh, address yourself to that. Um, so the first thing he says, addressing the employment crisis and providing immediate financial relief. To do this, we must also begin monthly payments of $2,000 for every man, woman, and child in our country, guaranteed paid family leave throughout the crisis. Wait, wait stop. Why don't you read? Uh, I'm just going to turn off if you're going to uh, if you're going to go six, uh, have a 50-page question. If you want to read them one by one, I can deal with them. I can't deal with a long, with a long novel uh, okay. and begin all over again. I'll say, I forget where you are. So let's start all over again. Absolutely. Okay. We'll take the first one. Um, how should we address the employment crisis and provide the immediate financial relief? Bernie's solution here is we must begin monthly payments of $2,000 for every man, woman, and child in our country, guaranteed paid uh, family leave throughout the crisis, so the people who are sick do not face the choice of infecting others or losing their job. Is that what you're talking about in terms of what? This is very similar to the MMT proposal for a guaranteed uh, uh, income. And uh, what Bernie says is the best way to introduce this uh, proposal of uh, uh, income is to uh, begin it during the coronavirus uh, when people actually need it. If you don't give income, to people who have been uh, laid off. Uh, and I think Bernie added, it should also be given to uh, uh, self-employed, uh, to retirees, to aliens who are living here. You have to give it to everybody or okay. else they're going to be out in the street. It has to be uh, 
uh, general. And I think a number of uh, our people have uh, uh, been recommending that uh, uh, over the years. Pavlina Chernova uh, usually uh, comes out with that, uh, explains that program as a sort of follow up uh, to what Stephanie and I and other people are saying. Absolutely, absolutely. The, the second point he makes, uh, along with what you've just said, we must guarantee health care to all. Medicare must be empowered to pay all of the deductibles, co-payments, and out-of-pocket health care expenses for the insured and uninsured and underinsured. No one in America is, is, who is sick, regardless of immigration status, should be afraid to seek the medical treatment they need. Here is the perfect uh, catalyst for uh, general uh, uh, health care uh, for all. Uh, uh, because the reason you have to give uh, health care for everybody right now without cost is that if you don't, they're going to be sick. And if you don't give them health care, they're going to spread the disease and the rest of the economy is going to get it. You've, I'm told that uh, my friends in Hong Kong uh, tell me that there has been a uh, second wave of a virus there. Uh, I'm told that in China there's a second wave. And if you don't give uh, the health care to everybody who needs it, and you don't begin testing for everybody and giving them uh, whatever they need to get well, including guaranteeing their housing that you just talked about, enough money to pay their rent, enough money to buy food, enough money to get by uh, when they're not uh, earning an income, then you're going to have uh, them can infecting the whole uh, rest of, of society uh, repeatedly. So here's the perfect uh, scale model and uh, dress rehearsal for Medicare for All. Yeah. Um. Third point, use the Defense Production Act to produce the equipment and testing we need. Uh, that's a uh, uh, nice thought in principle, but the problem is that America has spent uh, three decades since the 1980s uh, disinvesting and tearing up the industrial sector. Uh, it, it's very hard uh, even to get staples in this country. I'm told there are no screws or fasteners made in this country. Uh, how on earth are you going to uh, get a, an ability to, uh, create, uh, to develop the medical equipment, the masks and the other things you need? Uh, until, until the super in my building gave me a mask yesterday, uh, I didn't have a mask. And uh, I'm waiting for my Chinese friends, as I told you, to send me a mask. Uh, I don't see how it can be uh, made up. Now, these masks, I'm told, cost about 20 cents. They're being sold for $20. Uh, I think that the plan to produce them in America says, uh, let's give American monopolies the power of life over death, your money or, or your life, $50 a mask. Uh, and we'll, you can pay it on credit. We'll, uh, we'll send you new masks and you can sign up and uh, it'll be easy payment plan. We'll just bill you every month. The question is, uh, if it costs 10 or 100 times as much to produce it in America because they're producing for profit, uh, do you really want to leave this to private industry? Do you really want the health sector to be privatized? Because if it's privatized, it's going to be run uh, with the objective of getting monopoly rent and uh, extortionate uh, pricing and uh, uh, lowering the quality. And uh, basically, it will be rife with uh, the kind of fraud that we've seen in whenever there is uh, a kind of crisis. So I think that uh, Bernie wanted to say, yes, we should revive manufacturing in this country, but this is not something that can be done uh, quick enough to cope with the coronavirus. What the uh, government has been doing has been uh, grabbing sales of masks and uh, uh, other equipment uh, to Europe and other countries and uh, stopping sequestering it and grabbing it uh, and giving it uh, to basically the Republican states. Uh, I think uh, the uh, FEMA even grabbed uh, masks and uh, ventilators for Massachusetts and said, no, no, you're a democratic state. We're going to give it to uh, the Western states that vote uh, Republican. So uh, yeah, the system already is so deeply corrupted that I just don't see a short-term solution to this. But it's nice that he mentions uh, that maybe in 50 years we can reindustrialize. Understood, understood. Fourth point, make sure no one goes hungry. Um, as communities face record levels of food insecurity, we must increase SNAP benefits, expand the WIC program, 
uh, double the funding for emergency food programs, et cetera, expand meals on wheels, school meals programs, uh, deliver food to vulnerable populations. So extension of great society, more on poverty programs, it sounds like. The right. uh, question is, again, who will be administering this? Will this be a public program or a privatized program? I'm sure Donald Trump on Wall Street would love a program like that if they could be in it. And if they can charge the government $20 for every lunch that costs them $2, they'll love it. So the question is, uh, at what price, on what terms, and uh, uh, who's going to be the main beneficiary? Exactly. Two more. Provide emergency aid to states and cities. Congress yeah. must $600 billion in direct physical aid to states and cities to ensure they have the personnel and funding necessary to respond to the crisis. In addition, Federal Reserve must establish programs to provide direct fiscal support and budgetary relief to states and municipalities. How's That's that? an awful program, and he should be ashamed of uh, saying that. In other words, the, the problem the states and municipalities have is they're so deeply in debt, uh, and that this crisis is going to push them even deeper in debt. Uh, what uh, Bernie seems to be suggesting is let's abolish uh, all the public pensions uh, that they owe. Let's uh, cut back public services of everything. Let's uh, We have to let the banks be paid. Let the Federal Reserve load down the states even more in debt and make sure that they pay the bondholders, uh, who are mainly the uh, top 5% uh, of the population. So uh, he should be ashamed of himself. This is a bailout for the 5%. The state and local debt must be written off. It's a bad debt. Uh, there is, unfortunately, in American law, there is no procedure for state and local uh, bankruptcy. They can't wipe out the debt. Even worse, many states have a legal, uh, uh, written into their constitution, a requirement of balanced budget. If the Federal Reserve gives them uh, support by more, uh, more credit, uh, to be repaid, then uh, they're going to have to cut back social services. They're going to have to sell off the, the schools and let them be privatized. They're going to have to uh, uh, essentially uh, change the whole character of state municipal spending. And uh, it, the fact is you cannot save the states and localities after this crisis under conditions of the current debt uh, and financial uh, system overhead. Uh, this, uh, there has to be uh, federal funding uh, of one form or another or federal uh, uh, oversight saying the crisis has prevented the states, New York State, New York City, and others from uh, paying their debts. Uh, so we're going to write down the debts. Uh, this is going to cost the uh, bondholders uh, who hold tax-exempt state and local bonds. Uh, who holds state and local bonds that are tax-exempt? Obviously, the higher income brackets. Uh, somebody has to bear the costs. And Bernie's suggestion makes the 99% of the population pay the cost, not the 1%. And that is a terrible uh, solution. All right. Well, never... it, doesn't, it doesn't address uh, the debt problem at all, and without addressing the debt problem, uh, you're you're uh, he, you're part of the problem, not part of the solution. Understood. He, he may be trying to redeem himself a little bit here with the sixth uh, recommendation: suspend monthly payments. We must suspend monthly expenses like rent, mortgages, medical debt, consumer debt collection for four months. We must cancel all student loan payments for the duration of this crisis, place an immediate moratorium on evictions, foreclosures, utility shutoffs. Doesn't go far enough, correct? Or what does it mean suspending? Does that mess just mean, okay, I won't have to pay my rent this month, or next month, and uh, maybe October and, uh, or August and September? That's fine. What happens when October comes? When October exactly. comes, okay, uh, your uh, rent's uh, 1500 a month. Now pay us the $700, uh, $7,500 that uh, mounted up in arrears, or we're kicking you out. Uh, and we're, uh, we'll have a lien on uh, whatever you're supposed to get from Social Security, from other uh, things. We'll have a lien on your property. Uh, this is, uh, suspending payments isn't enough. They have to be annulled. Uh, you can't give the biggest giveaway in history to the real estate industry and then say the real estate industry gets to collect all the rents, but uh, they get to collect it by evicting the tenants and grabbing their property. This is a pro-landlord. Uh, it sounds like Bernie has uh, uh, become a cheerleader for Donald Trump. 
the way that he phrased that. It has to be non-payment. Again, you have to come right out and say what the problem is. You can't sugarcoat it. And uh, you, otherwise, you're trying to sound good with uh, actually uh, benefiting the very piece you're pretending to criticize. Understood. So the, the political resistance to um, what's going down is so feeble. Um, certainly during the 60s, we had a welfare rights movement that Richard Clower and Francis Piven uh, helped to organize and lead, which tried to put pressure from the bottom up to get some sort of guaranteed annual income. From the bottom up, led by the top down. Yeah. You know, I mean, come on, they were not very effective. They were... Uh, they were. They, were, they, they love the egotism of saying we're for the we're for the people. Well, the well, help. I'm, just, I'm I'm searching with you uh, and 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 uh, some of your ideas as to what we might have as alternatives at this point. Do you see any out there, and how people can mobilize and resist and organize? Uh, I think Reverend Barber is doing very good work. I think the Justice Democrats are doing good work. I think. Uh, the people around AOC, the uh, what, what are they called? The whatever it is, brand new uh, Congress. Uh, we've had some are doing good work, uh, but that that's not enough. Uh, it, it, it's very little because there's not much discussion of the economic problem or what is really at the root of this. There's a, a people complain about the symptoms and uh, the results of the inequity. They're pointing to the inequality. Uh, right. Even rich people uh, love that. Uh, uh, everybody loves uh, Piketty's book saying, look at how un unequal society is coming. But uh, what they don't want is any discussion of what's creating this inequality. Does it have to be this way? And what policies can we have to reverse it? And because if you discuss that, you say, wait a minute, if the root of this equality is the financial system uh, indebting the economy, if the root is debt, uh, and monopolization of uh, real estate, and uh, uh, then uh, you're going to have to uh, essentially the all this wealth, seeming financial wealth that's been created, takes the form of indebtedness of 90% of the population, and the only way to recover is to wipe out this debt. You can't recover the uh, real economy of production and consumption without uh, wiping out the debt. Uh, overhead without uh, uh, rolling it back. And that uh, is what uh, people are unwilling uh, to see. They're unwilling to look at the solutions uh, because uh, that's beyond the Overton window, as they say. It's, be, it's a cognitive dissonance. When you talk about actually curing the problem, as apart from simply you know rubbing your hands and say, oh, isn't it too bad, uh, all of a sudden, uh, you lose the coverage in the uh, public media, which is why we're on the internet, not on the uh, New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. Exactly. And you're one of the very, very few economists, uh, mm -hmm. historical economists, who have looked into the uh, philosophical and historical origins of this. Um, I mean, I became uh, an anthropologist and archaeologist uh, instead of an economist. In other words, okay. I was in Harvard's Peabody Museum, and that. Uh, uh, to focus on that, it was obvious that the debts were not going to be uh, uh, rolled back. You know, remember in 1980, every uh, the economy was so highly indebted that uh, uh, in 1979 and 80, when interest rates went up to 20 percent, everybody thought the debts would be uh, wiped out. And instead, you had the government play a new role, and the role was to uh, support Wall Street and to uh, uh, deregulate the economy. And... Uh, let in the Drexel Burnham, uh, Skadden Arps uh, era of corporate rating and uh, uh, finance, uh, financial takeovers and financialization that has caused the problem today. Well, if the problem is financialization, then the solution to the economy has to be to definancialize. That is, cannot be done as a slow process. It can only be done uh, in a single stroke, in a quantum leap, and that's by wiping out the debt and uh, uh, I don't see a constituency for wiping out the debt uh, 
as long as they believe that, uh, that you have to help the banks save the economy and uh, help the 1% uh, uh, trickle down their wealth. The 1% the has no intention of letting its wealth trickle down. It has Its intention is to take even more wealth than the 99%. Its uh, intention is to suck up, not trickle down, and its lobbyists have written the laws to make sure that the wealth is sucked up, not trickle down. And uh, unless you realize that there's a financial war of the financial sector against the rest of the economy, then, uh, as Warren Buffett said, there's a war on, and uh, but only we know there's a war. The, the victims don't even know there's a war. And the victims uh, become statistics um, that we're willing to put up with. Uh, one of the questions I have for you here, uh, each year, over 250,000 people die in the United States in what is referred to by social scientists as structural violence, the economic devastation of living in poverty, the strain, stresses, anxieties of trying to survive in the structures of work, family, criminal justice, health, housing, et cetera. We're willing to put up with that. We're willing to um, blame the victim, in a sense, and create a whole structure uh, that attempts to deal with their problems without addressing the, the structural roots. Economists call those externalities. In other words, external to the economic model. Just as uh, a global warming and uh, pollution is uh, external to the model. All the problems and the uh, external, the costs to society created by financialization and by uh, living in the short run are considered external to the model because all the models are short term. And all the models really focused on how can the 1% make more money? How can the financial sector make more money from the real economy? So uh, the, of course, uh, environmental pollution, uh, uh, personal violence, the suicide rate, uh, the emigration, uh, the shortening lifespan, that's all external. Because once you discuss them, then all of a sudden you broaden the problem beyond what economists talk about to what uh, society talks about, but all of the academic, what discipline is this going to be? Uh, sociology was developed as an, in an attempt to broaden economics to discuss overall social issues. Uh, just as the University of Chicago played a uh, narrowing sensorial picture in economics, it played a narrowing picture in sociology. Just talking about status, as if status is something uh, inherent and uh, given. Was invented, uh, uh, created as a discipline to sort of let's look at the long picture. That's been uh, uh, narrowed into uh, what uh, one anthropologist calls underwater basket weaving uh, in a study of uh, uh, primitive uh, uh, tribes. So you don't have an economic discipline that, as such, that is. Uh, talking about the kind of problem that you're discussing, because a discipline is something now very narrow. You need a pan-disciplinary approach. You need an overall approach that, that looks at society as an economic system, not as uh, separating one organ, uh, economics, from another organ, suicide rates, from another organ, public health, as if uh, none of them have any relationship with each other. So it's a disaggregated uh, system. There's nothing like uh, the kind of discussions you had in ancient Greece or Rome or Babylonia or ancient times when people uh, treated the whole social problem as an overall problem of uh, society, personal character, the environment, uh, everything else. Um, understood. Uh, Barber does talk about this to a certain extent by trying to make connections to Racism, ecological devastation, war militarism, the false narratives, the moral narratives that hold up uh, these injustices. That's the sort of analysis we need, the thinking, the narrative that we need to begin to pursue. But who's going to provide it? And uh, can, it, can you provide that kind of narrative in an academic framework, uh, the way that the universities uh, have divided their uh, educational system into disciplines? Can you provide it within uh, the media? Uh, is this something that uh, you'd expect to get discussed in uh, the New York Times or other, or the Wall Street Journal or other uh, major papers? Is it something you'd expect to discuss on uh, uh, ABC TV or MSNBC or Fox News. Uh, where are you going to discuss this? Division of Integrated Studies. Uh, you're, you, are you at NYU now? Are you also? My wife is a psychotherapist uh, at NYU. Okay. Uh, uh, that's the closest I come to it. 
closest. Okay, so no, I understand what you're saying. We're all in our little silos here, and and in the you know disciplines, so-called disciplines that uh, are not interconnected. Um, we don't see that in the media. We don't see that in the political world, in the in the uh, academic world, as you say, in the so-called spiritual religious world as well. Uh, you've written about how religion and economics has, has been so separated and uh, how that needs to be connected. You, you want to spend a little bit of time on, on that, if you would. Well, every religion goes as much uh, downhill just like classical economics uh, uh, was turned into uh, just the opposite of a uh, discipline from what it was in the time of Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill. Uh, when I was talking about religion and the economy, I was uh, begin by talking about Sumer and Babylonia and uh, the idea of uh, 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 religion as uh, uh, preserving economic stability. Uh, and it wasn't so much out of a idea of moral fairness and uh, religious idealism that uh, the Mesopotamian rulers canceled the debts. They wanted to prevent the economy from falling apart. They wanted to prevent uh, the taxpayers and uh, cultivators and on the land and the citizenry from falling into debt to an oligarchy who uh, would use their money to overthrow the rulers and take over society. Well, uh, as that happened, religion uh, followed them. Uh, religion tends to follow the uh, leadership of society and uh, uh, the leadership early on uh, in the third millennium, second millennium, even the first millennium BC, uh, the religious, uh, leadership could not afford uh, an oligarchy impoverishing the rest of society, because if an oligarchy did that, society would fall apart, and uh, uh, it was it's in the power. Rules, and yeah. religion would prevent it. But gradually, uh, as uh, Aristotle pointed out, every democracy turns into an oligarchy, and uh, the oligarchy tends to uh, take over religion. Uh, this is what uh, the Christian Bible was all about when uh, Jesus uh, accused the Pharisees of uh, loving money and of uh, replacing uh, the Jubilee year and the law, uh, Mosaic law with uh, uh, Rabbi Hillel uh, with the prose bull saying, we're waiving our rights to have debt cancellation uh, in order to get the loan uh, uh, that we need. So uh, same thing with Christianity. Christianity began uh, with the idea of Jesus' first a sermon. He said, I'm here to uh, proclaim the Jubilee year. He unrolled the scroll of Isaiah and said, uh, uh, this is my message. And uh, he was opposed by uh, the religion of his day. Christianity began that way, but by the fifth century of our era, it took the... Uh, African branch of uh, uh, Cyril of Alexandria and uh, St. Augustine that uh, said, okay, we're going to accept the world as it is. Uh, uh, it's okay for the landlords to have their land and for the rich people to be rich, but we will just ask them to behave morally and uh, act with charity, especially to us, the church. Uh, so uh, you, you have every religion uh, being uh, taken over, and so you need a continual renovation, a continual renaissance of uh, uh, a religion. And this usually, uh, it's easier to start uh, a new religion or something new, like a new academic discipline, than trying to reform the economics discipline, which I don't think can be reformed at this point, uh, or uh, existing uh, religions. Uh, uh, I don't know what's happening uh, uh, with the Catholic Church. Uh, we have a pope that uh, seems to uh, like like want to restore the liberation theology that the Catholic Church was uh, moving towards uh, uh, in the late uh, 20th century. I don't know what the future of that is. Uh, that obviously there was a fight and uh, uh, the last two popes uh, went out uh, opposing liberation theology. Uh, the Protestant religions, I don't, I, I think they're pretty passive in all this. So what, what do you mean by religion? It sounds like we're in the Iron cage, as Max Weber would put it. I thought you were going to say the end days. Well, I don't think he put it that way. But no, that's the book, book of Regula uh, Revelation. Yeah, right, right. But the iron cage of no way out. Of course, Marx saw a little hope in the notion of praxis, correct? Or Yes, he thought that... Uh, not only, he thought that industrial capitalism was going to be revolutionary in uh, 
fulfilling its historical destiny of lowering uh, the cost of production and lowering costs and being efficient by getting rid of the landlord class and uh, uh, the financial class by making uh, a credit a public uh, socialist uh, uh, activity and uh, making a land and natural resources uh, public. Uh, his idea was that uh, industrial capitalism would find an increasing role of socialism and uh, to be in its uh, self-interest. And in his day, you saw what was called state socialism uh, in Prussia uh, and the rest of Germany. Uh, and Marx was very careful to say, well, state socialism isn't really socialism. We've got to, at some point, uh, pave the way for the working class as the, uh, de uh, the democracy to take it over. And Marx said, well, look, the whole fight for democracy was led by industrial capitalism. It was industrial capitalism that saw the only way of getting rid of the landlord class and its predatory extractive rent seeking is to, uh, over to uh, replace the power of the House of Lords that had uh, uh, veto power over the parliament with a uh, publicly elected parliament. So uh, the followers of Ricardo and the Ricardian socialists and John Stuart Mill was parliamentary reform to extend the voting to the people. And Marx assumed that uh, it was perfectly logical that uh, industrial capitalists would act in their self-interest and voters would act in their self-interest. Uh, and uh, it hasn't worked out that way. It seemed to be working that way leading up to World War I, but World War I chain uh, sort of like a meteor that hit the uh, West's economic development and uh, knocked it out of orbit. And uh, you had, in fact, the rentier class, the landlord class, and the predatory banking class uh, make a resurgence uh, against the government. And instead of the government reflecting uh, democratic uh, in interests of industry and the people in rising wage wages and the rising circular flow and demand for industrial product and a, a positive uh, feedback between industrial production and uh, labor, you had uh, the financial rentier sector, what I call the fire sector, finance, insurance, and real estate, hijack the economy and uh, bring about uh, the uh, permanent depression that we're in now. And you have to realize that we are in a permanent depression. There will be no recovery without uh, a revolution that can't, to the extent of wiping out the debt burden, that as long as you leave the 1% uh, with all of the wealth, all of the property ownership, all of the financial claims on the economy, the economy cannot recover. And without realizing that, there cannot be a class consciousness of today, which is different from the class consciousness in Marx's time. Uh, and Marx, Marx talked about the class consciousness of, of labor vis-a-vis -vis its employers. But all that took place within the production and consumption sector. And today, it has to be the class consciousness of uh, basically wage earners because uh, uh, industrial companies have been turned into financial companies. They've been financialized. Uh, it has to be uh, a class consciousness that realizes that, well, it's up to uh, socialists to do what industrialism failed to do, to uh, free society from the rentier sector, from the landlord class, the monopoly class, and the financial uh, creditor class. Uh, without uh, freeing society from that, you're going to have a replication of uh, uh, the Dark Ages. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg said it's either Socialism or barbarism? Well, the barbarism is uh, a permanent uh, a depression, such as uh, the, all the classical economists warned against, uh, uh, as long as the uh, landlord class, the banks, and the monopolists uh, continue to run society. And the state has become a functionary of the financial sector. It has winded the way, in a sense, as Marx would have thought. Yes, it has not evolved in the way that Marx uh, anticipated right. to evolve. Well, I mean, Marx thought at least the state might be for state capitalism uh, that would be, uh, he worried it would be hand in hand with a heavy industry uh, and would uh, squeeze labor and not be, uh, 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 the question was, would uh, in, uh, state capitalism see its interest in supporting labor's living standards or not? Uh, but as it turns out, the financial sector is much more brutal than uh, uh, the industrial sector that Marx envisioned as in, uh, evolving towards socialism.
we're, we're about out of time, but I just got to ask you, are, are there any examples that you could maybe point to Denmark or Finland or anything of that we can point to as, as a model that might be something we could emulate to a certain extent? I haven't followed them to that extent. Uh, I okay. just certainly towards uh, uh, social control uh, helps, but uh, Denmark and Finland never let themselves be financialized in the first place. They never let uh, the 1% uh, the grab the control of the economy to the extent that has occurred in the United States uh -huh. uh, and uh, 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 much, much of Europe. So the problem is, how do you deal with uh, a kind of parasitic blister on society uh, to get rid of it? And can you get rid of it? Uh, it can only be by surgery, cutting off the blister. And uh, uh, Denmark and Finland have not had uh, to deal with it because they've remained more balanced. But what do you do when society has already lost its balance uh, and you actually have to think about structural reform? Uh, stru uh, structural reform is called an externality, uh, exogenous extraneous to uh, what economists talk about. And if they say, if you're talking about where the economy should go, you have to talk about what mainstream economists are talking about. Well, that means be passive and do nothing and uh, just uh, quietly uh, be like a frog boiling in uh, water. A frog boiling in water, wow. Well, listen, Michael, thank you so very, very much. Um, we're just about out of time. Um, it's been most enlightening. It's um, it's a challenge. Uh, even a counterculture will probably be tolerated and bought off as well. Some of the efforts of the 60s and uh, counterculture and hippie uh, attempts to build uh, alternative uh, communities and so on. That seems to have been also incorporated uh, by well, the- It's hard to have a counterculture that lives on trust funds. Uh, yes. It's hard to hold those trust funds. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Michael, thank you so much. Be well. Uh, it was great seeing you again. Thank you for so much for doing the show. And thank you so very, very much for watching on the Radical Imagination. This is Jim Vretto.